Welcome to the first video in our series on system design interviews. In this episode, we're shifting gears slightly to focus on a foundational topic that every large-scale system depends on, scalability. Before we can build intelligent systems that learn from data and adapt over time, we need to ensure the infrastructure they run on can handle real-world demands, billions of users, low latency requirements, and high availability expectations. Whether you're building a simple web app or a full-fledged ML platform, scalable system design is the backbone. We'll start with the basics, a single server setup. From there, we'll walk through how modern applications evolve, adding databases, scaling out horizontally, using caches and CDNs, deploying to data centers, and eventually adopting asynchronous processing with message queues. Let's get started with the foundation of it all. Let's start by walking through the key components that form the backbone of most large-scale system architectures. Initially, any system often starts as a monolith, a single server handling everything from request processing, business logic, to database queries. This setup is simple and fast to iterate on, but it quickly becomes a bottleneck as user load increases. As we scale, we introduce dedicated database systems, both relational and NoSQL, depending on use cases. The choice depends on the need for consistency, availability, or partition tolerance. Schema design, indexing, and query optimization become essential. Vertical scaling, or scaling up, means adding more resources, CPU, RAM, to a single machine. While it's easier to manage initially, it has physical and cost limitations. This often leads to the need for horizontal scaling, or scaling out, which distributes load across multiple machines. To reduce database load and speed up response time, caching layers such as Redis or Memcaked are introduced. We typically cache frequently accessed data like user sessions, metadata, or even full HTML pages for anonymous users. Content Delivery Networks CDNs help serve static assets like images, CSS, and JavaScript from edge locations closer to users. For even lower latency and high availability, we deploy across multiple data centers or availability zones, often behind global load balancers. Finally, message queues like Kafka, RabbitMQ, or SQS are essential for decoupling services. They help us handle spikes in load, allow for asynchronous processing, and improve fault tolerance by enabling retry mechanisms and buffering workloads. Each of these components plays a critical role in ensuring the system is scalable, resilient, and performant as traffic grows. In this slide, we walk through what happens when a user makes a request to a web application hosted on a single server. Domain names, DNS. When a user types a URL like www.example.com into their browser, the first thing that happens is a DNS lookup. DNS acts like the phone book of the internet. It translates the human-readable domain name into an IP address that computers can understand. This process ensures the browser knows exactly where to send the request. Internet protocol, IP address. Once the DNS resolution is complete, the domain name maps to an IP address, which uniquely identifies the server hosting the web application. The client now knows where to send the request across the internet to reach the correct machine. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP requests. The browser then sends an HTTP or HTTPS request to the server. This request includes the method, like get or post, headers, and sometimes a payload, like form data. It tells the server what the client wants. For example, it might be asking for the home page or submitting login information. Response from web server. The server receives the request, processes it, possibly querying a database or performing some computation, and then sends back a response. This response usually contains HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or JSON data, depending on what the request was for. The browser takes this response and renders the page for the user. In a single server setup, all of this, request handling, application logic, and sometimes even data storage, happens on one physical or virtual server, making it simple but limited in scalability. In this slide, 
we're discussing how to design a scalable database architecture as part of a larger web application system. 1. Separation of Concerns – Web Tier versus Data Tier To ensure scalability and maintainability, we separate the application into tiers. The Web Tier handles incoming traffic from web or mobile clients. It includes the application servers, APIs, and front-end components. The data tier is dedicated to data storage and retrieval, typically powered by databases and caching systems. This separation allows each tier to scale independently. For instance, if traffic surges, we can scale the web servers without touching the database. 2. Relational Database versus NoSQL Database Choosing the right type of database is crucial. Relational databases, RDBMS, like MySQL or PostgreSQL offer strong consistency, structured schemas, and support for complex queries and joins. They are a good fit for transactional applications. NoSQL databases like MongoDB, Cassandra, or DynamoDB provide high scalability, flexible schemas, and are designed to handle large volumes of unstructured or semi-structured data. These are preferred for use cases like event logs, social media feeds, or rapidly changing data models. In many scalable architectures, teams use a polyglot persistence approach, using different types of databases for different needs within the same system. 3. Database Replication – Master and Slave To improve both performance and reliability, we use database replication. The master database handles all write operations. It ensures data integrity and central coordination. One or more slave or replica databases handle read operations. This spreads the read load and enhances read performance. If the master fails, failover strategies allow a replica to be promoted to master, ensuring high availability. By cleanly separating tiers, choosing the right database technology, and leveraging replication, we build a scalable and resilient data backend capable of supporting high traffic applications. We'll discuss two fundamental strategies for scaling web applications, vertical scaling and horizontal scaling, and how they relate to architectural decisions like using load balancers and managing application state. One, vertical scaling, scaling up. In vertical scaling, we add more resources, CPU, memory, storage, to a single machine. It's simple to implement, no architectural changes. Good for early stages, but it doesn't scale well long-term due to physical and cost limits. Also introduces a single point of failure. Two, horizontal scaling, scaling out. Here, we add more servers to the system and distribute the load across them. This improves availability, resilience, and scalability. Requires a load balancer to route incoming requests to the appropriate server. Slightly more complex to implement because the system must handle distributed coordination. 3. Load Balancer A load balancer sits in front of your web servers and evenly distributes traffic. It helps maintain performance as traffic increases. Can be implemented at the DNS level HTTP layer, or TCP level. Also allows for zero downtime deployments and automatic failover. Four, stateless versus stateful architecture. Stateless applications do not store client-specific information on the server. Each request is independent. This makes horizontal scaling much easier. Stateful applications rely on session data stored on the server, making it harder to distribute requests. You need session persistence or a shared session store, like Redis. For scalable systems, we prefer stateless design, pushing state management to client-side storage or distributed session stores. Caching is one of the most effective ways to improve the performance, scalability, and responsiveness of a web application. Let's explore how and where caching fits into the architecture. One, why caching? Reduces latency for users by serving repeated data quickly. Reduces load on backend databases and services. Improves scalability, especially under high traffic. Great for data that is read often but doesn't change frequently. Two, types of caches. Client-side caching, 
browsers cache static assets like images, CSS, and JS files, controlled using HTTP headers like cache control. CDN, Content Delivery Network distributes static assets across global edge servers, reducing latency. Web server cache slash reverse proxy, e.g. varnish, Jinx stores rendered pages or parts of them closer to the user. Application level cache, e.g. Redis, Memcaked stores frequently queried data, like user profiles or product listings. Database query cache, some databases cache results of frequent queries internally or via materialized views. Three, cache invalidation strategies, time-based expiry, TTL data expires after a set duration. Write-through cache, update cache and database simultaneously. Write behind cache, update cache first and asynchronously sync to DV. Manual invalidation, app logic explicitly clears or updates the cache when data changes. Four, trade-offs. Caching introduces stale data risk. You need to carefully manage consistency. Overcaching can make debugging harder. Cache invalidation is notoriously hard. You have to strike a balance between freshness and performance. Let's now talk about two critical components for building globally scalable and responsive applications, content delivery networks, CDNs, and data centers, DCs. CDN, Content Delivery Network. A CDN is a globally distributed network of edge servers designed to cache and deliver static content, like images, JavaScript, CSS, and videos from locations closer to the end users. By serving content from the nearest geographical location, CDNs dramatically reduce latency, improve load times, and decrease origin server load. A key operational setting in CDNs is the cache expiry time. It defines how long content stays cached before being refreshed. This helps balance freshness and performance. DC, data center. A data center is where we host the core application infrastructure, servers, databases, and services that power dynamic content and business logic. With multiple DCs, we can redirect traffic based on geography, load, or availability. For example, East Coast users can be routed to a DC in Virginia and European users to one in Frankfurt. A major challenge is data synchronization, ensuring consistency between DCs, especially for user data, sessions, and transactions. DCs are also where we conduct testing and deployments, often in a staged rollout to minimize risk. For instance, we might deploy to one DC, monitor performance, and then expand globally. Let's talk about message queues, a core building block in scalable and resilient web applications. What is a message queue? A message queue acts as a buffer that distributes asynchronous requests between different parts of a system. Instead of sending data directly between services, components communicate through a queue. This helps balance loads and ensures that systems can operate independently and reliably. Key roles. Producers or publishers are the services that generate messages, for example, a front-end server logging user actions. Consumers or subscribers are services that read from the queue and act on those messages, like a backend service storing analytics data or sending emails. This setup allows producers and consumers to work independently and at different speeds. Decoupling benefits. Loose coupling. Producers don't need to know how many consumers exist or what they do. They just publish messages. Scalability. You can scale consumers horizontally without affecting the producer. Resilience. If a consumer crashes or slows down, the queue can temporarily hold messages until the consumer recovers. Typical use cases. Sending email or SMS notifications in the background. Order processing and e-commerce systems. Logging and event tracking pipelines. Microservices communication where services operate asynchronously. Technologies. Common tools include RabbitMQ, Apache Kafka, Amazon SQS, and Google Pub slash sub. Each has its strengths depending on throughput needs, delivery guarantees, and infrastructure.